Welcome to this Fertility Within Reach webinar, A Guy's Guide to Male Infertility. I am Jennifer Neely, a Fertility Within Reach board member who will be moderating this webinar of distinguished guests, and we encourage you to share what you learn here with the hashtag Fertility Within Reach. I'm going to ask each of our distinguished guests to introduce themselves, and I want to start with Dr. Sharon Morieri of OC Fertility. Hello, Dr. Morieri. Nice to meet you all out there. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Sharon Moyeri. I've been a reproductive endocrinologist for close to 20 years. I actually grew up in my uh, current practicing uh, town of Newport Beach, California. I trained locally at UC Irvine and uh, UCLA, went to fellowship up at Stanford University and then made my way back home. I've had my own practice here in Newport Beach since 2007. And I've been working with Dr. Aaron Spitz, who's uh, my colleague here today, uh, for close to that amount of time. Thank you, Dr. Moyeri, and thank you, Jennifer. I'm Dr. Aaron Spitz. I'm a male fertility specialist, and I've been in practice for over 20 years. And Dr. Moyeri and I have shared many patients uh, in our practice, and uh, we continue to help couples have children. It's been very exciting and very gratifying. And what I would like to do today is share with you some information about male infertility. And so I'd like to present to you a talk about a guy's guide to male infertility. It takes two to tango. A lot of times infertility is thought to be a problem with the female partner, but half of all infertile couples are infertile because of, in part or in whole, a male issue. But the guy is often overlooked because the assumption is so much so placed on the woman inappropriately. So today we're going to dig into what might be going on with male fertility. We'll start with an anatomy lesson, take a look at how to understand sperm tests and what the different sperm tests are, and then dig into strategies for maximizing fertility. We'll look at lifestyle considerations, which we all have control over. And then we'll look at various known causes and medical uh, and surgical treatments for male infertility. So here's an anatomy lesson. Uh, the testicle is where the sperm is produced and then it's stored in the epididymis. And uh, from there, it, it's transported around into the urethra uh, at the base of the penis where it's joined by fluids from the prostate and seminal vesicles and that makes the semen. And from there, it's ejaculated out. And now let's dig into the testicle. The testicle is where the sperm is actually produced and there's these little tiny tubules inside the testicle that um, make the sperm, They're like little sperm factories. And after the sperm is made, and it takes about three months for the sperm to be made, it uh, moves into the epididymis. And the epididymis is where the sperm is stored and where it learns to swim. So the sperm start to move as they trans transport down through these tubules. And this takes about two weeks, about three months in the testicle, about two weeks in the epididymis, and then it's ready to go to work. The sperm is then propelled up during ejaculation through the vas deferens. And the vas deferens tube is surrounded by a thick muscular sheath that squeezes the sperm up during ejaculation. Now within those tubes, I mentioned it takes about three months for the sperm to form. The sperm actually starts out as these germ cells and they undergo several rounds of division where they become uh, these specialized cells with heads and tails and little parts on the heads called acrosomes that can bind on to the egg. Uh, but it takes this whole two and a half, three month process. That, therefore, when we talk about lifestyle changes and diet and medications and other treatments, understand that it's gonna take some time for these early cells to get the benefit of whatever treatment we're talking about to affect and improve the sperm at that end point. So how about sperm testing? What, what does it mean? A lot of time, uh, my patients walk in with their tests in hand. They've looked at it, but they're really not sure what they're looking at. Well, on a typical sperm test, you're going to see a few different categories. The volume, that means how much semen was there. And normal semen is about over one and a half cc's up to about maybe six or seven cc's. So about a, a, a teaspoonful uh, more or less. Concentration, that's how many sperm there is in each cc of semen. And normal concentration is more than 15 million sperm per cc. We make about 350 million sperm a day in those little tubule factories, but in our semen, when we ejaculate it out, at least 15 million per cc. And then 
the motility, which is the percent of sperm that are moving, we like to see over 40% of them moving or swimming. And then the morphology, the strict morphology, that means the shape, the appearance of the, of the sperm. When you look at it under a really high power microscope, how perfectly formed is it? And you know, there's millions and millions of sperm in the ejaculate, but only a very small percentage are actually perfectly shaped. And normal percent is above 4%. Only 4% or higher have to be perfectly shaped for this to be considered a normal test. However, a lot of the tests we see have a little section that says normal is greater than 14%, but that's actually not really correct from a clinical standpoint. Now, even though these are the normal numbers, what this really kind of busy slide shows is that these normal numbers don't really match up to reality as much as you might think. So if you look at the black bars in the first graph on the left, this is uh, sperm concentration, millions of sperm per cc, and the black bars are couples that have um, uh, babies, okay? So these are fertile, these couples are fertile, and you'll see that the sperm concentration in these couples who have babies can be less than 10 million sperm per cc, or they can be greater than 100 million sperm per cc, or anywhere in between, but most of them settle out at between 48 to 100 million sperm per cc, but even at very low counts, these couples can have babies. And then the white bars are the couples that can't have babies. They're infertile couples. And look, even when the sperm is over 48 million, or over 100 million, you can have couples that can't have babies. And these are couples that don't have known female factors. So there's a big overlap between normal sperm counts and fertility and abnormal sperm counts and fertility and vice versa. And then the graph on the other side, on the right side, is the motility, the percentage of sperm moving. And once again, Lots of couples who are fertile can have motility below 40%, uh, below 30%, even below 16% uh, in some small number of couples. But many couples that are infertile can have normal percent of sperm moving. So it's a tricky thing, the semen analysis. It's tricky to, to put a finger on. But when you look at all of it and distill it all down, squarely fertile couples the men tend to have sperm concentrations of about 48 million sperm per cc with motility or movement over 63%. But there are plenty that fall into the category of fertile after all, even with lower counts than that. Now let's look at another kind of uh, way of uh, drilling down onto that sperm test, which is paying closer attention to that Kruger strict morphology. Remember I mentioned that you just have to have 4% or more looking normal. And the way they determine is they look that the sperm is normal is they look at the the head of the sperm, the, the mid piece and the tail of the sperm, and they have strict criteria that they're growing by. And what happens is that if a guy's strict morphology is lower than normal, there might be some difficulty with that guy causing a pregnancy naturally uh, or with artificial insemination, both instances where the sperm has to do the work of finding the egg, binding to it and dumping the DNA into the egg. But it's, it's a maybe, it's a maybe, because I've seen many couples where the strict morphology is actually below normal, one or 2%, where the other parameters, the count and the motility are normal, where the couples get pregnant. So it's not a for sure correlation, um, uh, but it's a possibility. And so we, we try to use this information the best we can. Uh, there is another test called DNA fragmentation. And this looks at how the DNA in the sperm is packaged up for delivery into the egg. It doesn't look at uh, gene mutations and it doesn't predict birth defects, but what it does predict is that if the packaging of the DNA, the way it's coiled up uh, to be packaged into the chromosomes, if there's some fragmentation in that packaging, it may not function as well. And so pregnancy may not occur or there may be a higher incidence of miscarriages. So if uh, an uh, increased fragmentation may predict that natural conception or artificial insemination may not work so well where the sperm has to dump its DNA into the egg and it has to function properly. However, with in vitro fertility, an abnormal DNA fragmentation, a high DNA fragmentation, tends not to have nearly as much effect. And so here's a graph that shows with natural conception and with intrauterine insemination, where the sperm has to do the work of binding to the egg, if the DNA fragmentation is below 20%, the odds of that working out are normal. But if it's 
higher, more fragmented than 30%, the odds are low. And between 20 and 30, it's declining, called sort of the, uh, the gray zone or the borderline area. Problems that a guy can have with sperm. He might not have enough sperm, or the sperm may not be moving properly, or they may not be shaped properly, that, that morphology, or they might have increased DNA fragmentation, or all of the above may be at play, some of the above may be at play, or he may have no sperm at all. So the treatments for male infertility are to try and find out, well, what is the underlying cause of this? And we don't always know what the underlying cause is, but in many cases we do. And then see if it's a treatable cause. Now, in some cases, we cannot change the sperm count. In those cases, we have to work with what we have. And if there's 5 million moving sperm in the semen, we can do insemination as long as the DNA fragmentation is okay. Insemination is where the sperm is put into the woman's uterus, but it still has to find the egg and bind to it and fertilize it. Now, if the sperm count is below 5 million moving sperm, that technique doesn't have a very high likelihood of working. It can still be done, but the success rates are gonna be rather low. And in that case, in vitro fertilization is recommended. And in vitro fertilization is where the sperm is put in the same dish as the egg in the laboratory. And in some cases, it's actually injected into the egg directly, so it doesn't even have to bind to the egg and put its DNA into it. It's done in the laboratory, and that's called ICSI, I-C-S-I, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And when the ICSI technique is used, all you need, actually, is one living sperm for each egg. And in many cases, the number of eggs that are being worked with is in the yeah, between sort of 5 and 20 uh, range. Now, if there is no sperm available, then we can use donor sperm for intrauterine insemination, for example. So here's a depiction of intrauterine insemination. And this is when we've got 5 million moving sperm or more. It's typically recommended. And the sperm is deposited directly into the uterus through a very soft, flexible catheter where the egg will drop down from the fallopian tube into the uterus to be met by the sperm. In vitro fertility, on the other hand, is the removal of the egg through the vagina and then the combination of sperm with the egg in the laboratory. And then the uh, egg fertilizes, turns into an embryo, then the embryo is put back into the woman's uterus to make her pregnant. And ICSI is where the sperm is injected directly into the egg in the laboratory under very high powered, uh, sophisticated microscope. So, now, what are the causes of these problems? Well, we'll look at lifestyle. We'll look at testosterone, a very common cause of low or no sperm count. Uh, a condition of too many veins known as varicocele. Very obvious cause, which is vasectomy. Other causes of blockage. And causes that result in the testicle just simply not working very well, unable to produce very much sperm. And problems with just ejaculation itself. When we consider lifestyle, we think of things like diet and exercise, nutritional supplements, habits like alcohol and drug use, other conditions, as well as how we approach sex itself, the timing of intercourse, and our ability to function normally as men, being able to have intercourse to bring sperm into the uterus. So on the side of diet, my recommendations based on the science that's been looked at with regards to what kind of diets result in the healthiest sperm is to decrease animal products in the diet. Eating mainly a whole, whole food plant-based diet is really the best for sperm count and movement and quality. So eat from the produce section and avoid the dairy section, avoid the butcher section. Nuts are great for your nuts. It turns out that a handful of walnuts or mixed nuts a day has been shown to improve sperm quality and counts. And also minimize or eliminate processed foods. Avoid things that come in wrappers, boxes, or cans. Basically, try to do most of your shopping and eating out of the produce section. Exercise is also good for sperm as it is good for you. Moderate exercise, strenuous exercise, all good. Um, 
Bicycle riding is a great form of exercise. I get asked all the time if they should stop riding bikes. The problem with bicycle riding primarily is with erections. Some guys are sensitive to the shape of the seat because of their own anatomy and it pushes on nerves and arteries that are important for erection. But bicycle riding does not tend to affect the sperm production unless the guy is really riding many, many hours uh, a week in tight bicycle shorts where it's causing a lot of heat. But for the typical bicycler, it's not a big problem. Now where heat really does come into play though um, is with uh, jacuzzis. Uh, so you want to avoid jacuzzis after the workout or, or really anytime because one, one seating in the jacuzzi can affect your sperm count for uh, up to three months. It's a temporary effect, but it is a prolonged effect. Showers are okay. Um, I wouldn't do hot baths. Uh, there really hasn't been much benefit proven to uh, boxers versus briefs. That degree of temperature change is really not shown to be of much significance. Icing your testicles has not really been shown to be of much significance. Now, one comment on uh, endurance athletes. You know, in our community, there's a lot of uh, triathletes and marathoners. Our weather's perfect for that. And for the very uh, extreme endurance athletes, it has been shown that sperm counts and testosterone are lower. And that's probably a response to the physical stress these guys put themselves under. But there has not been any data showing that they have a lower fertility rate after all. Uh, or any issues with their sexual function. Uh, it's just that you may see lower numbers on paper in that population. All right, how about nutritional supplements? Uh, there's, there's lots and lots of nutritional supplements out there, and it does turn out, in fact, that they can be helpful. Nutritional supplements are often formulated in blends for male fertility, and these are blends of uh, different uh, herbal components and vitamins that have been proven individually or in combination to improve sperm counts and motility and even DNA fragmentation. Now these effects tend to be mild and uh, they are not miracle. If a person has no sperm in their semen, they're not gonna suddenly have a normal count on these, but they do have a more beneficial effect. And the way they work is often through um, their action as antioxidants. There are molecules that are in our bloodstream from the environment, from food, from being overweight, different causes of, of these molecules called free radicals that are degrading our cells, including our sperm. And these nutritional supplements uh, are playing defense uh, in our bodies. But these are supplements. These are not substitutes. These are supplements to a good diet and good exercise. So you still wanna eat lots of fruits and veggies and nuts and beans, and then add these to the mix. We also wanna be careful with bad habits, alcohol, drugs. So it's not that you can't drink at all, but I would tell you if your sperm counts are exceedingly low, you have very little cushion there, uh, you probably do wanna eliminate alcohol, but if your counts are not exceedingly low uh, or normal, in fact, we consider five alcoholic beverages a week or less uh, to not have much of a, of a negative impact on fertility. Um, Marijuana is, is an interesting topic. It's been controversial, and it turns out that the data does not show a significant harm to normal male fertility in a guy who is normally fertile if it's used moderately. But if it's used frequently, uh, daily use, chronic frequent use, it may in fact have a negative effect on sperm. And like with alcohol, if you have very low counts to begin with, probably should eliminate it as another toxin that your body just doesn't have that much cushion against. Narcotics like uh, Vicodin and Oxycontin, uh, Tylenol of Codeine, uh, these, if taken on a chronic regular basis, will shut down a guy's testosterone and shut down their sperm. Heroin does the same thing because these are all in the same family of opioids. So chronic narcotic use sometimes is required by men who have chronic pain conditions and they really require it, but they may not realize that it's undermining their fertility. And it can be treated, fortunately, but it is a cause of low sperm counts in some men. And then other drugs like cocaine and crystal meth, these make your body sick. They impair your circulation all over your body as well as to your testicles and therefore impair your sperm counts. Some guys have other health conditions, diabetes, obesity, that in fact are also due to their lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle, poor eating choices. And these conditions of diabetes and obesity will undermine their fertility because they cause a decrease in the uh, circulation throughout their body and it undermines the blood flow and health of sperm production. Also undermines nerve function, diabetes, 
impairs nerve function and can make a guy unable to ejaculate or unable to ejaculate completely, lowering his sperm count. Uh, and obesity will lower a guy's testosterone level, which can then lower his sperm count. Also, all that fat produces free radicals into his bloodstream, which is undermining the health of all his cells, including his sperm cells. And being obese raises that guy's risk or chance of getting diabetes and then having another insult to injury. Other health conditions that can affect uh, male fertility include high fevers, such as with a cold or a flu. Fever can knock down sperm uh, count or motility for up to a few months, just like as with a hot tub exposure. Uh, severe infections in the testicle itself damage sperm production. Again, that can last up for several months. Or if the infection is very severe, it can cause permanent scarring and drop off in fertility. Uh, some severe infections that are known to do this include mumps, as well as sexual transmitted diseases that go untreated, or just uh, bacteria such as E. coli that might originate uh, from a urinary tract infection. COVID is a big question mark right now. Some studies showed very little virus getting into semen and other studies, in fact, are showing virus getting into semen. It does turn out that it's harder for the COVID uh, virus to invade into the testicle because the receptors that are required are a lot fewer there. But nonetheless, uh, there is information showing that it is showing up in semen. What the implications are for actual fertility and sperm production are not known. Certainly if a person gets COVID and becomes sick and has a fever, that's going to have a negative impact on sperm production like any fever would. But the science on that is still evolving. And then there's medications. Uh, guys with infertility may also have other conditions such as ulcerative colitis or seizure disorder that require medications that may lower sperm count. And once that's identified, in many cases we can switch to different medications for that same condition that don't have that same negative effect on sperm. And then some guys with male infertility have occupations that bring them into exposures that can be negative for sperm, such as oil refinery toxins. And workers on oil refineries sometimes have been shown to have a higher rate of male infertility. Or uh, men who work with a lot of insecticides have demonstrated this effect as well. And those who work with extreme heat, such as welders or firefighters, can have a higher risk of having lower sperm counts or uh, less fertile sperm. Let's talk about the timing of sex. Okay, it's important to be able to have sex successfully. And, um, and a lot of guys will, will have performance pressure. But let's assume you're able to, to have sex successfully. How often should you have it when you're trying to get pregnant? Well, it's best to use an ovulation predictor kit understand when ovulation is happening because that means the egg is coming down into the uterus but it's only there for 24 hours so you got to be ready for it now sperm lasts several days in the woman's uterus not just 24 hours so you can have sex for several days in a row and that sperm will accumulate and the numbers will increase and they will be alive and waiting for the egg building up what i call a welcoming party and it <laughs> turns out that if you ejaculate several days in a row quality of your sperm as measured by the DNA fragmentation actually improves. Fragmentation gets to be less and less and less. Now it is true your counts will get lower and lower and lower each day you ejaculate in a row, but those previous sperm that you ejaculated are still there, still alive, and the quality is getting higher and higher and higher. So the combination of increasing quality, even though the counts are declining on that day, but accumulating from the previous days leads to my recommendation that you have sex every day for five or six days in a row, leading up to and including on that final day, the day of ovulation. Sex after ovulation really doesn't do much because the egg has already passed through. Now, sexual function can be an issue onto itself. The pressure that couples face who are battling infertility can have a negative effect on the guy's ability to perform sexually or the frequency of sex that's required. As men get older, their refractory period gets longer. It gets harder for them to uh, be ready for sex again as quickly as they used to when they were younger. Uh, but even for younger guys, just the psychological stress of the whole ordeal of time, sex, sex on demand can take a toll. And fortunately, for most men who are suffering from a performance pressure, erectile dysfunction, pills like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Stendra have no negative effect on fertility and can be taken uh, very safely. Uh, 
there really is very little health risk with these pills unless the guy is on nitroglycerin for a bad heart. And so couples that I see where the guy's having trouble sexually, um, I will routinely prescribe them one or another of these medications and it allows them to get back to business because these pills cause an increase of blood flow to the penis that overrides the effects of stress or anxiety, which physically slows down the flow of blood to the penis. It doesn't make them hornier. Uh, it doesn't give them an erection when they don't want to. It just helps them have sex when they want to and when they need to. Let's look at how hormones regulate fertility to understand why testosterone treatments and testosterone shots, which are really popular now, are not a great idea. So the way that sperm are regulated within the guy's body is that there's a signal that comes from the pituitary gland at the base of the brain. It's kind of behind your eyeballs. And this signal is called luteinizing hormone or LH and follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. The luteinizing hormone stimulates the testicle to make testosterone from these special cells inside the testicle that make testosterone. And that testosterone then bathes the sperm in the uh, tubes next to it. And that sperm grows under the stimulation of testosterone. It also grows under the stimulation of follicle stimulating hormone coming down from the tutors. So these two, these two hormones are making the sperm grow. And the testosterone goes from inside the testicle to the rest of the body through the blood circulation. But in the testicle, the level of testosterone is 100 times higher than it is in the bloodstream that's going throughout the body. And the brain is receiving the blood back and it's analyzing what the level of testosterone is in the blood. And if the level of testosterone in the blood is sufficient, it doesn't keep sending the LH and the FSH signals. But if it's not, it'll keep sending it to keep that level consistent. But remember, when the body is making, when the testicle is making its own testosterone, it's 100 times higher in the testicle than it is in the circulation. Now, with that in mind, if a guy takes a testosterone shot, even though the amount of testosterone he's getting in his uh, bloodstream is normal for the brain and his muscles, it's 100 times too little for sperm production. And guess what? That shot is telling the brain that there's plenty of testosterone in the blood, so the brain stops releasing the signal FSH and stops releasing the signal LH to the testicle. Therefore, these cells are no longer making the testosterone themselves, and now the sperm is only seeing the same amount of testosterone that the rest of the body is seeing, which is 100 times too little. It's not seeing any FSH anymore, and it stops being produced. So when a guy goes on testosterone shots, it causes his testicles to power down and he stops making sperm. So what do you do if a guy has low testosterone and he's suffering from that, but he wants to preserve his fertility? Well, there are other ways to boost testosterone. You can use a medication called Clomid. And what Clomid does is it makes more of the FSH and more of the LH gets secreted by the pituitary. So it boosts the production of testosterone even higher by the testicle, and that makes that testosterone at that hundredfold higher level that the sperm needs because it's coming from the testicle itself. Another way to treat it is with HCG injections. HCG doesn't boost the FSH and LH signal, it acts like an LH signal directly. And so it's like a stronger LH signal directly injected into the blood, and then that reaches the testicle, and that boosts the testicle's own production of testosterone higher, which boosts the sperm production better. So these are how we treat guys with low testosterone that want to preserve their fertility, but we don't give them testosterone shot. Now moving to other common causes of male infertility that are, that are medical, most common one is varicocele. Varicocele means enlarged veins. And so many guys have enlarged veins around their testicles. And for the majority of guys that have it, it's a normal variation. It's just how you're built. It has no negative consequence whatsoever. But for some of these guys, those enlarged veins cause the blood to flow too sluggishly and it makes the testicles a little bit too warm. Testicles need to be about two degrees cooler than body temperature for sperm to be produced. That's why testicles hang in the scrotum outside of the inside of the body. Whereas ovaries don't need that temperature change. That's why ovaries are inside the body. So when the testicles are outside of the body in the scrotum, they can be a little bit cooler, but the varicoceles 
can short circuit that and make them a little bit too warm. And that can result in, in degradation of the production and the motility and the shape and the DNA fragmentation across the board. It can impair all of those things in guys who it's affecting. The way we treat this is with surgery. We go into the groin, that's like where our hernia is, and we come down onto the veins as well as the testicle itself, and we look for the abnormal veins. And under high magnification, we can see the abnormal veins and we block them off or we tie them off. And uh, this stops the flow in them, they collapse down, and now only the normal veins and arteries are flowing and the temperature cool uh, uh, drops and the, and the testicles start to function better. So how well does it work? Well, it works pretty well. It doesn't work for everybody. We don't understand why, but it will work in about 60% of men for whom we uh, do this procedure. And it can work even in pretty severe cases. So in guys who have extremely low counts, under one and a half million, when they undergo this operation, up to 20% of them may actually go on to have a natural conception. And if their counts are, are low enough to where they need um, IVF, uh, but, but enough where they don't have to use ICSI, about 30% of them may go on a natural conception. IUI range, five to 20 million, almost 40% go on a natural conception. And if their counts are greater than 20 million, uh, about 60% go on a natural conception. So it can work, but it doesn't work for everybody. And it's certainly a decision that needs to be made with uh, the male fertility expert and the female fertility expert to decide what's the optimal approach for that couple. For example, a guy may have varicoceles, but his partner may have an, uh, an egg issue or an ovulation issue. And in that case, even though varicoceles ligation might help that guy with his fertility, it's not gonna help his partner. And in that case, in vitro fertility or artificial insemination is really the better play. So it, it does require careful consideration, but we just wanna point out that this is a common cause that can be treated. Um, the surgery itself uh, is about two and a half hours long. If it's uh, on both sides, about one and a half hours, if it's on one side, guys typically back to office level work in a couple of days and back to sex and exercise in about two weeks. Now. It doesn't work overnight. As I mentioned, sperm production takes about three months and it takes at least a couple rounds of sperm production to see a meaningful change in the sperm counts. And typical pregnancies will occur somewhere between uh, nine months and a year and a half, sometimes up to two years. So it's a bit of a watch and see with this particular treatment. How about another cause of infertility that's super obvious and that's vasectomy. And I see a lot of couples where the guy has changed his mind uh, for one reason or another. Maybe circumstances have changed and they decide they really did want to have another child, or maybe he is in a different relationship now and wanting to start a family again. So the treatment for vasectomy can be vasectomy reversal. And this is where the two ends of the vas deferens are sewn back together with very precisely placed sutures, which are less than the width of a human hair because that passageway that's being sewn back together is only a third of a millimeter in diameter. So this is a microsurgery, and this is what it looks like under the operating microscope, with these two tiny passageways surrounded by the muscle that squeezes to propel the sperm up. And here's with this, these tiny little sutures laid in. You, you can barely see them. Um, and vasectomy reversal can be successful, but it's more successful the sooner that it is done. So if a guy changes his mind within two, three years, the uh, pregnancy rate's about 75%. Patency meaning that sperm is coming through with technical successes close to 90%. And as the years go by, the success rates drop. So by 15 years, you're down to about a 30% live birth rate. But fortunately, there's actually no time after which you can say reliably that it will not work. It's just that the success does decline as the years go by. Um, other causes of blockage is ejaculatory duct obstruction. Some guys are born with a cyst that will uh, squeeze off the, the duct that the semen flows through and that the sperm flows through to get into the urethra of the man. So on this anatomy picture, here's the testicle, the sperm's gotta go all the way up and around and then enter into the base of the urethra and the prostate and seminal vesicle also put fluid in there. And all that can get blocked right here with a cyst uh, or, um, or with a cyst or with a stone or with infection. Um, and this will result in very low volume of semen with no sperm in it. 
And then some guys are actually born without vas deferens. This is typically in the case of a genetic mutation, but occasionally it can be due to an absence of a kidney where they don't form a kidney on one side, they don't form a vas deferens on one side. But in most cases, that won't result in fertility problems because they have the other side. But in cases where it's a fertility problem, they don't have a vas deferens on either side. They have testicles, they're making the sperm, it's getting up into the epididymis, it's getting its movement, but then there's no vas deferens to carry it up into the semen. And uh, the cystic fibrosis gene mutation is the most common cause of this when it happens on both sides. This is a gene that people can carry, but if they get it from both of their parents, then it manifests itself as this problem. And in some cases, it can manifest itself as cystic fibrosis, a very severe condition of the lungs and the pancreas that causes all kinds of problems with breathing and pancreatitis um, and, and can make for uh, you know very difficult medical uh, course and condition, but we've gotten a lot better at treating it over the years. However, in some men, all it does is it results in a lack of the vas deferens. When a guy has this condition, we can treat them. We have techniques for, for getting sperm and helping them have a baby with IVF. But because it's a genetic condition that could affect their child if the mother is carrying it as well, then we need to make sure that the female partners of these guys are screened for the cystic fibrosis gene. <clears throat> and even if they are carrying it, the embryos can be screened themselves. And so we can help these couples actually have healthy babies, even in spite of this condition. So how do we deal with these blockages, whether it's a vasectomy, whether it's a, a blocked ejaculatory duct or no vas deferens form, we can treat all of these by getting sperm directly out of the testicle, which we call testicular sperm extraction. And that's where we make a little cut in the scrotum, um, a little cut in the scrotum, and then a little cut in the testicle itself. And through that little cut in the testicle, we can extract a little bit of tissue. And that tissue is where the sperm is made and it'll have sperm in it. And if you look under a magnifying uh, view, under a microscope, you'll see that these tubes are filled with the sperm. And that sperm can be divvied up into different batches and it can be frozen. And then when the couple is ready to do in vitro fertility, one of those frozen batches can be thawed out and the sperm can be plucked out of there and injected into the eggs. Another technique is with a needle. Instead of making a cut, you can aspirate the sperm directly out with a needle, sucking it up. Now, there's no incision required for this method, but typically the yield of sperm is quite a bit lower. And there is a, a greater risk of bleeding because you're not actually seeing if that needle is hitting any blood vessels or not. So even though the incision method seems more invasive, actually has a lower complication rate. And it actually gives a higher yield of sperm. You can also pass the needle into the epididymis. We know the sperm is formed in the testicle, but then it gets its movement in the epididymis. And you can try to slurp it right out from there with a needle. Again, no incision, but the yield of sperm you get is gonna be um, a little bit on the low side compared to if you do an open incision and, and get a larger amount of sperm. Um, the way you do an open incision to get sperm out of the epididymis is called a MESA, or microsurgical epididymal sperm aspiration. And so we actually cut open the skin uh, and then cut open the lining around the testicle, come right on that epididymis, cut that lining open, and then under an operating microscope, we can put a needle right into the tube and slurp out the sperm from there. The advantage of that is that those sperm are moving and many laboratories prefer to work with the moving sperm and therefore this technique gives them the sperm that they like to work with the best and it gives them a high amount of it compared to a needle aspiration and in many cases enough to freeze and use for other cycles if that should be needed or desired later. All of these techniques that retrieve sperm from the testicle require that the sperm undergo ICSI or injection directly into the egg because that sperm doesn't have the other molecules and enzymes that are in semen. So when a guy ejaculates semen, there's a lot of molecules, enzymes in there that make that sperm able to bind to an egg and give it its DNA. But when you extract the sperm directly, you don't have any of that. And if you put that sperm in a dish, it'll just sit there. It won't bind to the egg. It won't penetrate the egg. And so it has to be introduced into the egg with the ICSI technique when you're using extracted sperm. But fortunately, that technique works very well and has uh, been proven to be safe. There are other conditions where sperm just simply isn't being made at normal amounts or perhaps not at all. It's not a blockage problem, it's a production problem. And uh, commonly understood conditions are genetic conditions 
where a guy has an abnormal number of chromosomes, such as Klinefelter syndrome, where he has an extra X chromosome, X, X, Y. Normally guys have an X and a Y, and women have an X and an X. And if you have an extra X, you'll be a very normal functioning man, but you will likely have very little or no sperm production. Or guys who are born with undescended testicles on both sides, even if they're corrected, he's at risk of having very low sperm production throughout the rest of his life. If it's just undescended on one side, the risk is much lower. Or guys that get cancer and require chemotherapy, radiation, this knocks out sperm production, and in many cases, the sperm production does not recover. Or a severe infection such as mumps on the testicles, particularly if a guy is in his teenage years, that can wipe out sperm production. But in many cases, guys come in with very low sperm production or no sperm production, and they don't fit into any of these categories. So about 40% of guys still uh, are unknown as to why that's happening. And that's just the limits of our science at this point in time. So in cases of very poor, poor sperm production, there might actually be sperm present in the testicle, just not enough to show up in the semen, or the amount that's showing up in the semen is so little, so poor, it can't even be used with in vitro fertility. In those cases, the way we help these men is to try to find the sperm in the testicle where it is, extract it, and use it with in vitro fertility. Now, sperm production in the testicle may be spotty. It might be here and there hiding in little pockets like these pink areas on the slide, but not in the majority of the tubules. Or it may be all throughout the tubules, just a very, very low level. To try to find where the sperm is, uh, I employ a technique called testicular microdissection. And that's where, uh, under anesthesia, we get down onto the testicle itself and we open it up across the middle and pull the two halves apart so we can see all the little tubes inside. And what we're looking for is an area of tubes that are a lot thicker than the rest of the tubes that have no sperm in them because the thicker tubes are likely to actually have some sperm in them. And when we pluck them out and the scientist looks at them under the microscope, what they see is actually sperm in those tubes, but not in the others. And that sperm can be used for in vitro fertility. Here's what it looks like in, in reality. You can see all these little white stringy things. Those are the same tubes as these, only they're empty. And these are the areas where the tubes are full of sperm. And that hand gets handed off to the scientist in the room who then takes it off to the in vitro fertility lab. Another way of trying to find sperm is with needle mapping. So instead of making a cut, you just go right through the skin of the scrotum with a syringe and you aspirate a little bit and then you squirt it out onto a slide and see if there's any sperm in that spot that you stuck the needle in. And you do it in numerous spots on each of the testicle and you create a map a map of where it was and where it wasn't. And this is a, a way to understand if sperm is there and where it is, but it's not a way to get sperm for the IVF procedure at that time. You have to go back later to go after the sperm in the spot where the map told you it was to use for unbite vitro fertility. Now let's talk about a different problem, which is the problem with ejaculation. I mentioned it earlier with diabetes. And this is a situation where a person isn't able to ejaculate normally. Um, Diabetes causes this because of the nerve problems, the nerves that stimulate the vas deferens to squeeze the sperm up and that stimulate the base of the urethra to contract and the bladder to, to shut itself closed so that the semen come out, out the tip of the penis. None of that works properly in, in severe cases of diabetes. And so even though the guy might experience a climax, there's no ejaculation. Another common cause for this again, related to a nerve problem, is spinal cord injury. So if the spinal cord is injured, the signals can't get down to the testicles and to the base of the penis to tell those structures to, to contract and to expel the sperm. And so no ejaculation will occur there. Um, and so with these situations of, of problems with ejaculation, sometimes you can reverse the problem with diabetes. Good sugar control can sometimes bring ejaculation back. Sometimes you can make the structure squeeze a little bit better with Sudafed. Sudafed's a cold medicine, but it's got an adrenaline-like effect, and it can make those structures squeeze a little bit better. But if it's a spinal cord injury, uh, or if it's a severe nerve issue, you may have to directly stimulate the nerves with electrical stimulation called electroejaculation, uh, which is done through the rectum. Or if none of those techniques work, or if they're not available, you can also retrieve sperm directly from the testicle or directly from the epididymis, just as you would for cases of a vasectomy or absent vas deferens, and use that sperm with in vitro fertility. In summary, 
it does take two to tango, as I mentioned. And I've talked a lot about male infertility and the different treatments and different options. But when we come down to what we choose, we go back to the female partner and we want to take it in the context of what is the woman's fertility status? What is her age? Uh, what barriers does she have? How long will this treatment on the guy take to get him up to speed? And will that be a big risk factor for her? Does she have a limited timeline? What's the couple's goals? Do they want to try to have a child as soon as possible? Or are they willing and able to wait and see if some of these treatments that I mentioned will work over time? And so all this requires really careful consideration with the woman's fertility doctor. And so Dr. Moyeri and I coordinate quite a bit on patients and, and couples taking all of this into consideration when arriving at a treatment plan. So male infertility is uh, a big factor in infertile couples, uh, uh, affects up to half of couples, uh, but it's complex. Our understanding of it is growing. We don't know the cause for everybody, but we know the cause for many. And even the most severe male factor cases have an opportunity for treatment. That was great to hear Dr. Spitz talk about all this. Lucky for me to be able to hear it too. Um, I do have a couple questions I wanted to talk about just what you were getting back to. We always talk about the woman's age and how important that is. Is there an age in particular that you start to worry about the man's side um, related to age affecting either embryo development, embryo quality, or having any uh, issue with the offspring of those uh, pregnancies? And how do you advise your patients? Men don't have that same kind of precipitous drop off mm -hmm. in their fertility that women experience uh, known as menopause. Mm -hmm. And men will continue to make sperm throughout their life, even into a very advanced age. But the quality of the sperm indeed, from a genetic standpoint, will start to decline. And we typically look at about um, age 40 or after as, as, as that threshold. Now, again, it's not a dramatic drop off like with menopause, but it has been shown that there are some issues with uh, conditions such as uh, autism, for example, um, uh, that increase with, with the aging male. Now, fortunately, it's a very low percentage. Um, the increase may be significant, but it's an increase from a very low number to a higher, but still very low number. It's not nearly on the order of risk that you might see with advanced maternal age and Down syndrome, for example. It's funny you say with the women's menopause, I like to call the guy's side the manopause. So I don't know if and there's been any language like that in the literature. But so 40 sure. is kind of the age you start to think about. Yes. And again, this is more of a, a consideration of the genetic integrity of the sperm. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really an issue of sperm is no longer being produced the way uh, in menopause, eggs are no longer being produced. Um, Dr. Spitz, it was nice to hear you talk a lot about diet for the men, because we talk about that with our female patients. And again, there is always so much focus on the female side of the equation. So hearing that equal focus on the man's side is really uh, wonderful. Um, so guys do often ask this question that if my sperm look okay and, and you know, I'm producing enough sperm, do I really have to care about my uh, drinking or my diet? Um, and you touched a little bit on that. Do you have any specific kind of guidelines for, um, for men who question that, that, you know, lifestyle factor in the context of otherwise normal appearing sperm? As I mentioned in my presentation, the semen analysis is a tricky test. And there are a lot of couples who have normal semen parameters and are unable to get pregnant, even though they can't uh, identify some other cause. And then there are couples who have uh, low counts and get pregnant. So mm -hmm. a normal semen analysis does not tell the whole story. There can be other factors that we can detect, such as DNA fragmentation, that might be abnormal, even when the other parameters are normal. And DNA fragmentation can be made worse and worse by bad diet and sedentary lifestyle, drug and alcohol use. So even if things look good on paper, they may not be all that good in nature. Not to mention, we're learning more and more about this thing called epigenetics, which mm -hmm. is these um, factors in our genes that sort of switch on and off good and bad genes and can really change our health as a result of the environment we're in or stresses we come under or the kind of food we eat. And we don't know nearly enough about epigenetics uh, yet to make um, 
you know, very strong conclusions, but the data is pointing that alcohol and drug use, maybe switching genes on and off, that can have downstream effects on the children later in the children's life, including heart defects and heart disease related to a parent's use of drugs or alcohol. So word to the wise is, you know, stay healthy, not just for your sperm, but for your children, because what you do to your body may even have profound effects on your kid's body, even later on in their lives. Yeah, it's super interesting, the epigenetics. We'll have to do a, a separate thing on just epigenetics, I think, coming up soon. So that's a fun one to talk about. <laughs> An area I love. I'm always uh, fascinated by genetics. Yeah. Uh, so on a practical level, you did talk about frequency and timing for intercourse with natural conception. And, of course, um, you had some really great um, information that actually I wasn't totally aware of. So I was glad to hear about the fluids and the uh, semen contributing to supporting the sperm that might already be present in the woman's uh, uh, reproductive tract. So I know with my patients, sometimes that frequency can be really become a chore rather than a fun kind of interchange. So how do you balance frequency of intercourse and outcomes without creating this dynamic of it's becoming work and not fun anymore? Well, I think if patients understand why we're recommending them to have sex mm -hmm. frequently, that helps. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're told to do something just because I said so, <laughs> you tend not to want to do it. When you understand why you're doing the thing you're being told to do, it really helps quite a bit. But even so, like I said, there's going to be, there's going to be issues with that for a lot of guys in these couples. And they're going to have performance anxiety or they're just going to be kind of, you know, tired out. And that's where prescriptions um, from your doctor, such as Viagra, Salus, these kinds of prescriptions can really be helpful. Another thing that I didn't point out, but is good to mention here, is that many men with male infertility also suffer from low testosterone. They don't realize it until they are evaluated. And with low testosterone, it's hard to perform sexually or to perform sexually frequently. And when I'm treating these couples, I'm also able to restore their testosterone levels, not with testosterone injections, because that shuts mm -hmm. off sperm, but with other methods such as Clomid or HCG. And that also helps these couples approach more frequent intercourse more successfully. Yeah, so they a twofer for that one, right? They feel better and get more sperm. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. right. Um, one last question I get a lot from our uh, male and female partners, uh, actually the women often bring it up because the guys don't want to talk about their hair issue, but is use of um, hair loss products, um, either Rogaine or Propecia, and how that may or may not impact um, sperm production uh, or sperm function. And what do you advise for men who are really concerned about hair loss and want to use a product, but we're, the partner's particularly the female might be concerned about how that's affecting their fertility. So Propecia has been shown to impair uh, sperm, but it is not a, uh, a consistent cause and effect. So there are many people who take Propecia and are normally fertile, but if a guy is suffering from infertility, I would definitely uh, think about removing that from the equation. However, uh, Rogaine does not appear to have any negative effects on male fertility. And so if you can choose between one or the other, and you're looking at male factor infertility, I would consider relying on the Rogaine uh, rather than the Propecia. Right. Okay, um, we have one last question I wanted to talk about, and that is um, a question about, you know, some of these assisted reproductive techniques. Um, you did discuss ICSI. We do a lot of ICSI because we do a lot of embryo testing, and so, we do want to isolate one sperm DNA with one egg DNA. Um, and then we also do um, a fair amount of extraction um, from couples who may have had vasectomies or have other reasons for um, not being able to extract the sperm through ejaculation. So how do you guide them as to the risks to the offspring? There's a lot of literature that talks about ICSI causing birth defects, some of it probably a little older, um, but it comes to the uh, office during our consultations. Um, do you think that ICSI or TESI or uh, MESA PESA have any increased risk to those offspring or to the pregnancies? Well, I think that the outcomes with in vitro fertility um, 
show that the risk to the uh, offspring is, is low. It's not a zero risk, but it, it is a rel relatively low risk. And additional risk from using ICSI over IVF, I think, um, has not been uh, strongly demonstrated. Mm -hmm. I think it's all um, in the similar bucket of risk, whether it's IVF or, or ICSI itself. And it's interesting in that sperm that are extracted from the testicle have been shown to have less DNA fragmentation than sperm in the semen in men who had abnormal DNA fragmentation and were failing IVF otherwise. Mm -hmm. and so given that the quality of the sperm that is extracted in some men may be even better than what they're ejaculating and that that higher quality sperm is then being used in ICSI, there may be some advantages for the outcomes in that child uh, versus you know, what might have uh, occurred with natural conception. It's just theoretical, but I, 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 do not, um, I do not fear that the ICSI process is bringing a significant increase in risk to the child that these couples will have. Yeah, we, we say the same thing, but I always wonder if, you know, what the urologist side of that equation is. Um, and I, I've never heard what you had just said about that being uh, lower DNA fragmentation. Do you think that's partly related to the man's lifestyle and um, the impact uh, yeah. with the seminal fluids? It could be. It's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting question. It may be just as simple as the dwell time. You know, the sperm mm -hmm. has just been minted. And now it's going to be at least two weeks, maybe a few months before that sperm sees the light of day, as it were. And just that period of the clock running may cause a degradation. Or there may be factors in the circulation of the man that that sperm gets exposed to over the course of its dwell time in the epididymis before it's released that degrades it, actual toxins in the blood. Or, or, and, and that might be excess alcohol, drugs, or the guy's job or environmental toxins. But in some cases, you can't really identify an obvious reason why the guy's DNA fragmentation is abnormal. And therefore, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a mystery, but may just be related simply to the, to the, the time the sperm is, um, is around after it's produced and, and degradation related to that. Really this, is, this is why I pointed out that frequent ejaculation yeah. results in improved DNA fragmentation because after six or seven days of ejaculating in a row, mm -hmm. the sperm in that day seven ejaculation has not been around as long. It was made more recently. It has not dwelled in the system as long and it has a better DNA fragmentation. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, our patients worry a lot about um, depleting their sperm reserve with right. frequent ejaculation. It turns out that sperm can survive in a Petri dish for a couple months, mm. believe it or not. With the, with the culture media? Yeah, and sperm survive inside the women's reproductive tract. You know, that environment uh, coupled with the uh, components in semen enable the sperm to survive. So even though a guy's sperm count will drop between uh, two, three, four days of ejaculation in a row, the mm -hmm. sperm that he deposited two, three, four days ago is still there in play. Yeah. And yeah. so you're sense. accumulating sperm rather than depleting it. And you're also coaxing out the sperm with the lowest DNA fragmentation that you can by doing that frequent ejaculation. And so rather than ejaculating five or six days in a row, you know, with say masturbation or, or without intermission, without sex, and then on that last day when it really counts, having intercourse with your low fragmented sperm, but very low count sperm, you're doing both. You're layering in the sperm over the several days and the quality is improving and hey, may the best sperm win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's important to our patients is this natural selection process, letting the healthy sperm find their way, um, which, which kind of gets back to that ICSI question of selecting the sperm. Fantastic question. For folks that may have just be, be learning about you, how can they find each of you? My practice is called OC Fertility or Orange County Fertility. Our website named the same, ocfertility.com. Our phone number 706-BABY. I'm in practice at Orange County Urology Associates. So you can find us online at orangecountyurologyassociates.com. 
And you can also get some more information in general about some of my other projects and some of my other information at aaronspitz.com. At Fertility Within Reach, our mission is to increase access to health benefits for all fertility treatment and preservation. Thank you for joining us and have a great one.